In this third talk, I want to stand back and look at the whole history of paradigms in the social sciences, particularly anthropology, over the last 500 years, applying the ideas from anthropology and elsewhere that I discussed in earlier talks. The implications of the earlier talks was that we can analyze Western cosmologies, uh, theories in the philosophies of the social sciences, as if they were cosmologies in any civilization, large or small. And that we should not only isolate the different paradigms, but also try and analyze what caused them to change. So this would follow standard anthropological practice in relation to other societies. You go somewhere and you look at their cosmology, their systems of beliefs and ideas. And it would follow the observation in such societies that people only believe and accept as explanations certain things which fit into their categories of thought and into their experiences of life. They tend to create and recreate their systems of meaning alongside changes in their society. Thus, for example, myths and beliefs are manipulated in order to justify or explain the present. You keep changing the past to fit with the present. Obviously, it's not as simple as that. Uh, the past and theories of how we got here and where we are going to appear to most people, appear to grow quite naturally and we assume they are correct. But as you look over longer and longer periods of time, you see how relative they are to the type of civilization that produced them. It's not as crude as some neo-Marxists would claim that ideologies are just reflections of social relations, um, but they certainly are partly determined by economic, social and class relations. So let's have a look at the philosophical systems from a very broad stance and then in the later lectures I'll refine this. There seem to be three major paradigms of well, this was my view in 1982, it's been changed a bit since then but I think it's roughly right. And curiously they fit with a famous idea in anthropology which is of the rites of passage, rite de passage, where you have a previous state, a flat, you're moving along, then you go out of time and space into a, a, a liminal phase and then you come back, everything changed into a new phase. So three stages as it were. And if we look at the history of the social sciences, it, it, it is possible to fit it quite neatly into a three-stage theory. Firstly, cyclical time, time coming back on itself, which I'll explain. And then from about 1700, roughly, um, progressive time, time moving forwards and increasingly upwards with the evolutionary phase. And then finally coming back and time becoming static again in a different way with what we can roughly term structuralism from about 1890, 1900 onwards. This fits, uh, for example, with the stages laid out by Vogt uh, in his uh, History of Anthropological Theory. Uh, which he divides into developmentalism from 1725 to 1890, structuralism from 1890 to 1940, and specialization since 1940 onwards. And it also fits in with the interesting work of Nisbet on sociological theories. Uh, he sees progressivism, developmentalism, evolutionism, as the dominant philosophy in Western Europe from the 18th to the 19th centuries. He writes, for two centuries, the dominant philosophy of history in Western Europe had been progressive, there were doubters. But as against the views of the majority of philosophic rationalists, 
reaching from Bacon and Descartes through Condorcet and Ventham in the uh, late 18th century to Marx and Spencer in the 19th century. These occasional doubts are ne negligible. It's uh, interesting that it's really in this progressive phase, in other words, the 18th, 19th century, that the modern social sciences, including anthropology, were born in two great surges, one in the 18th century progressivist, what we call the Enlightenment, and then again in the later 19th century in the evolutionary phase. This is when my discipline really was founded. Um, this is put forward, for example, um, the foundations of the social sciences, a general social sciences science thus branched off from history. This is Nisbet. This differentiation in the 18th century was accompanied by a wide acceptance of the idea of progress. And on the basis of this integrative concept, a general history of mankind was attempted. That's what the 18th century Enlightenment thinkers tried to do. The later differentiation in the 19th century, the later differentiation of anthropology from this main social science stem around 1860, the founding of modern anthropology, was prompted by the historic growth of disciplines, such as geology and paleontology, which had much to offer in the search for man's ancestors. Once again, and this is Nisbet, a revolutionary idea, evolution, integrated the anthropological domain and defined its goals and the basis of explanation. The anthropological goal was clearly seen as a revelation of the early history of mankind. And then later you get increasing increasing differentiations, for example, between social anthropology, which is mainly British anthropology, and cultural anthropology, which is mainly American and to a certain extent French. And then from the 1930s more differentiation, economic anthropology, political anthropology, urban anthropology, psychological anthropology, and so on. So these are the three big phases which I'll be considering. And let me describe each of them in a little more detail as a background for later lectures. The first up to uh, roughly 1700 is what you might call cyclical or repetitive theories of time. Basically the idea is that there is no lineal advance or progress in human history. There is nothing new under the sun. But societies and institutions ebb and flow. The most we can hope for is to regain the wisdom of our ancestors, to go back a renaissance of some kind. Time is envisaged largely as a wheel. Empires rise and fall. We can only hope to be reborn and return to the glories of former civilizations, whether it's of Rome and Greece or Confucius uh, and Mencius. As, we shoot, as we'll see, this is the dominant philosophy and paradigm from Greece up to the 17th century. One of the best uh, illustrations of this is actually outside the main European tradition on the North African coast, the great Arabic philosopher and historian Ibn Khaldun, um, in his Muhadima, an introduction to history, uh, as described by the editor Franz Rosenthal, he writes, um, Ibn Khaldun emphasizes the distinction between nomads and town dwellers. The former, the nomads, roam about the desert in groups held together by asibaya, that's clannishness, integration, community, gemeinschaft, as you might call it, a sentiment originating in blood relationship, which causes each member of, to subordinate his individual interests to those of the clan. The wants of persons in this state are exiguous, they don't need much, and they display many virtues of which courage is the most conspicuous, although they have no scruple about raiding and pillaging. The need for justice within the group causes leaders to arise 
and when the groups become sufficiently numerous they migrate to fertile lands and ultimately change into town dwellers or subdue already existing town communities, adopting the previously established civilization. He, he wrote this for North Africa as a cycle, but you can see the same thing in the history of China, uh, the settled Chinese being subjected from time to time by great waves of uh, immigrant uh, nomadic peoples, most famously the Mongols and then the later the Manchus, and then these people becoming Chinese, being absorbed into China. The town dwellers become luxurious and lose their capacity for self-defense. The rulers, as their wants increase, must resort to constantly increasing taxation, and resenting the claims of their clansmen to equality within themselves, they rely for aid on foreign supporters who become necessary because of the decline of the clansmen as warriors. Thus the state, state grows decrepit and becomes the prey of a fresh horde of nomads who undergo the same experience. The period which constitutes the normal life of the state is about 120 years or three generations and then it starts over again. The point about this is, is a famous cyclical theory three generations and it goes back to the beginning and great historians like Gibbon and others looking at the rise and decline of the Roman Empire and Ibn Khaldun could see no particular progress but long cycles with history going back to its roots again. The cyclical view continued as I mentioned roughly till the, towards the end of the 17th century and then you begin to get the idea of some possibility of progress, of development. It starts quite mildly in a, a gradual growth or at least time moves forwards and you don't return back again. And this developmentalism has um, two aspects. There's um, a first gradual developmentalism, slight growth, and then very rapid growth, almost exponential, uh, which I'm going to call evolutionism. Um, so at the beginning it's advancement, as in the advancement of learning with uh, Bacon. Um, an idea of we're moving forwards and we're better in some ways technically or in uh, our health or something than people in the past. Um, first it's not very extreme, it's progress but it's um, and the very word enlightenment is to do with that, it means from moving from the dark, darkness of the Middle Ages um, into a lighter world uh, another metaphor that's often used is of polishing. You have a rough, for example, a rough stone, and you polish it and make it uh, better. You don't change the stone. It's not a dramatic change. It's just all the rough bits are polished off. And the same with the metaphor of enlightenment. And then later, you have a completely um, more extreme version which we call evolutionism. Um, and the, the other difference is that progressivism really moves, tends to move along one or two dimensions, mainly technical advancement and uh, an improvement in rationality and tolerance and these sorts of things. But evolutionism moves on every level, as we'll see. It tends to include moral improvement, aesthetic improvement, political improvement, every kind of improvement simultaneously in a very dramatic way. Um, so these are the big changes and uh, its difference between progressivism and evolutionism on all sorts of levels. The contrast is caught by Radcliffe Brown, the anthropologist, when he describes progress. He says, it is convenient, I think, to use the term progress 
for the process by which human beings attain to greater control over the physical environment through the increase of knowledge and improvement of techniques by inventions and discoveries. The way in which we are now able to destroy considerable portions of cities from the air is one of the latest striking examples of progress. This is obviously ironic. Progress is not the same thing as social evolution, but it is very closely connected with it. So you can have progress in manufactures, weapons, uh, biological warfare, whatever. It means the system is more powerful. Um, pro prog progressivists uh, see much more continuity. As I say, the stone is polished, but it's still the same stone. Whereas evolutionists see it as change in real, the nature and structure of the stone. Things change less quickly. It's not a total transformation as envisaged in this metaphor. Whereas evolutionism implies that totally new forms of structure will emerge as with famous, famously biological e evolution, where you have some species, you have a fish and then a fish later turns into a mammal um, and so on. It's a real structural change. This is a difference is again illustrated by Radcliffe Brown um, when he describes evolution as I understand the term refers specifically to a process of emergence of new forms of structure. Organism evolution has two important features in the course of it, a small number of kinds of organisms have given rise to a very much larger number of kinds, so you have differentiation. And two, more complex forms of organic structure have come into existence by development out of simpler forms. So it's the growth of differentiation, the growth of complexity. Like organic evolution, it can be defined, this is social evolution, in two features. There has been a process by which from a small number of forms of social structure, many different forms have arisen in the course of history. That is, there has been a process of diversification. Secondly, throughout this process, more complex forms of social structure have developed out of or replaced simpler forms. Thus, with animals, as I say, new species are developed and new features added. You have a wing or a beak or whatever it is. Applied to human societies, this means that you have new moralities, new political systems, new, new kinship systems or whatever. So the uh, developmental phase, uh, the middle part of my trilogy, is um, divided into two, between progressivists and evolutionists. The, f the first wave, the Enlightenment thinkers, uh, Condorcet, Voltaire, uh, Lord Keynes, Robertson, uh, uh, to a certain extent Adam Smith, um, Miller and others, um, are one phase, and the second phase are the 19th century evolutionists, Marx, Spencer, Morgan, Tyler. The impact and importance of evolution uh, as a phase, subphase within this, is so important that I think I'll spend a little time just describing the general features of evolutionism. The Oxford English Dictionary defines evolution as follows. The process of unrolling opening out or disengaging from an envelope. That's not an envelope as in postage, I think, but an envelope of a plant in, is in an envelope. The opening out or unfolding of what is wrapped up, a roll, a bud, whatever. The spreading out before the mental vision of a series of objects. Uh, in geometry is the unfolding or opening out of a curve, the straightening out, it's curved and then it begins to uncurve. Um, and in biology of animal and vegetable organisms or their parts, the process of developing from a rudimentary to a mature or complete state, for example, you have the evolution from a seed to a tree. Uh, another meaning is the development or growth according to its inherent tendencies 
of anything that may be compared to a living organism. And this is very important because the biological um, metaphor built into evolutionism, which uh, comes out very clearly out of Darwin, Wallace and so on, is um, one of the founding ideas within the second great wave of anthropology and social sciences of the later 19th century. So you have very simple political systems in remote primitive societies and then they gradually become more complex and they unwind. So with language, with politics, with economics, it's from the simple to the complex. It's a growing, it's not a, a revolution. Evolution is continuous. Revolution is, is a sudden break. But the effects of a, a lot of evolution is revolutionary. There's thus a sense of some continuity but also change. The seed is not the tree, but the tree is in some way related to the seed. So, as I'll explain later, you can understand a lot about these big changes through the metaphors that are used. The metaphor for progress, in the progressive phase and the enlightenment, is a mechanical one, a Newtonian one. The move, movement across space of an object, gravity, clocks, machines, things like that. The metaphor for evolution is an organic, biological one, the growth of a tree, of a human from a sperm to a um, for, fully formed adult, etc. Then there are some sub-questions within evolution. Um, First, does human progress follow a straight or uniform line of development that is irreversible? Can we go back? Second, is the process of advancement dependent upon some imminent principle or intrinsic organisation that predestines, rather like a seed, this, uh, an acorn, uh, the seed of a, an oak tree, can't suddenly uh, decide someday that it wants to be a beech tree, it is going to be an oak tree. So is there something innate within organic evolutionary systems? Likewise with, um, you might apply it to human societies, um, could um, a medieval Japanese civilization suddenly decide that it wanted to be um, some other civilization? Thirdly, there's the direction the way in which it is heading and the degree to which it is subjected and changed by external forces. Now, the idea of evolution is very important and um, I'll just elaborate just a little bit more because different thinkers use the word in different ways and you can actually argue about almost all of them that they are evolutionists or not. For example, is Karl Marx an evolutionist or is he not an evolutionist? An anti-evolutionist because he's a revolutionist. I mean, he thinks that he's a revolutionary thinker. He thinks that the stages are new. And yet, there are stages and growth. So, some sub-questions. Firstly, is there a moral dimension to evolution? Is it from worse to better? in a moral sense, from lower to higher. Then again, is the evolutionary framework universal? In other words, unilineal evolution, um, that all societies have to go through the same stages. This was a very strong belief in the form of 19th century evolutionism. Um, biological evolutionism tended to go through a certain set of stages, Marxist evolution, Morgan, the anthropologist's evolution, tended to go through stages and people began to think you had to go through all these stages. You couldn't leap frog. And then how does one move from one stage to another? There is the internalist explanation that uh, it's internal conflicts. The Marxist is a famous example. Um, or the Darwinian, that there are modifications uh, caused through genetic variation and so on and so on. Uh, or um, the 
there's external factors, for example, from the impact of ideas from the outside, uh, invasions and so on. Then there's the difference between gradual evolution, continuous evolution and revolutionary changes. There's the length of the stages. Um, do they last for a long time or a short time? The number of levels on which evolution occurs for instance, uh, is it just mainly technical, technological, from uh, agriculture to industry, or is there also a change in all sorts of other things, aesthetics, cooking, uh, house arrangements, uh, morals, marriage, whatever. Uh, and finally, are we all heading in one direction? Uh, where are we uh, going to? Um, and are we all heading in that direction? Actually, there's another very important thing which I should have mentioned and which will be the centre of a lot of these lectures, which is what causes evolution. The dynamic or moving force. What is the uh, force? Is it internal necessity, as, for example, Spencer argued, a kind of natural tendency from simplicity to complexity? which was a widespread 19th century view, uh, or Marx's view of the dynamics of the dialectic of class confrontation, or uh, is it population growth and uh, natural selection, as Malthus, uh, as Malthus to a certain extent argued, and then Darwin, of course. Um, is it rationalization? Some of the things I talked about in the first lecture. And um, returning to the destination, uh, are we moving towards some final, agreed, unified destination? There's the optimists who think we are moving forwards and we will finally end up, to a certain extent, Karl Marx is one, at a future socialist utopia, or the pessimists, the later Max Weber, who thought we were moving towards the iron cage of bureaucratic rationalization. So there's all sorts of different forms of evolution and different experts looked at different parts of it. For instance, uh, rational, rationality and the growth of rationality in an evolutionary way were looked at by 19th century historians like Lecky and sociologists like Max Weber, uh, morality by others, civility and sophistication um, by others, economics by a number of anthropologists and others, personality, politics, law and so on. So there is progress and development. I now want to look at the final main stage, which is structuralism. I'll look at uh, structuralism and some of the possible reasons for the changes in paradigms in uh, the next part of this lecture, uh, or talk, lecture four.